Hello everyone. Today we will be learning about the reproduction in higher plants and in this video we will be learning about the gynecium, the structure of an anatropous ovule, the development of a female gametophyte as well as the generation of megaspores. Along with that we will also be learning about the type of pollination, the different agents of pollination and the different outbreeding devices plants employ. Let's start with the gynecium. Gynecium forms the female reproductive wall of the flower as the androecium forms the male reproductive wall. The male reproductive wall is formed by the gynecium. Each unit or each member of the gynecium is known as a carpal and it can also be called as a megasporophyll because it is the one which bears the megaspores which are your female gametes. It consists of three basic parts, the stigma, the style and the ovary. The stigma is the receptive part of the carpal. This is where the pollen layer will come and attach to the female reproductive organ that is the gynecium. The style is the pathway through which the pollen tube will get a route to enter into the ovary. Through this it will go and it will release the microspores wherein it will bind with the microspore my megaspore and it will form an embryo now there are two conditions associated with the structure of the carpal first one is the apocarpus condition if you can see each of these tiny dots that you see are the different carpals which are present this is the champa flower now each carpal is separately visible and hence this is known as apocarpus condition where you can see or that each carpal is free. When we come to the syncarpus condition you can see all the carpals are fused. So this is the stigma, this is the style and this is the ovary. Here you can very well see that you, the carpals are not individually observed so you cannot see different units coming out. All of them have fused into the same tube and there are different stigmas which are present in this region. So this is the syncarpus condition. Now, ovule is a complex structure which consists of various members which help in protecting it and providing it with nutrition because it is going to be the future plant. So an anatropous ovule which is most commonly observed in angiosperms shows the following structures. Let's start with the funiculus. The funiculus attaches the ovary to the ovule. So if you see this ovary ball and this, these are the ovules. Now each ovule is attached to the ovary ball. This point of attachment consists of a placenta. This each ovule is attached via a placenta to the ovary wall and the stalk that attaches the ovule to the ovary wall is called as the funiculus. The placenta supplies nutrition to the ovule. Now the region where the funiculus attaches to the ovule body is known as the hilum. This is typically a notch like structure which is present here. Then we have the nucellus. This is this nucellus forms the bulk of the ovule, the dotted region in the center, the egg like dotted region. This is the nucellus. This is diploid and it is parenchymatous in nature and it is the main part of the megaspore engine because this is forming the maximum bulk of it. This is the region where the megaspores are formed. Now we have a chalazal region and a micropylar region. The chalazal region is the region which is present directly opposite to the micropyle. And this is where the integuments, these structures which are coming down, these arise from the chalaza. Each of these structures is called as an integument. So the outer one that you see here 
This is known as the outer integument and the inner one that you see here is the inner integument. The integuments after the formation of the uh, seeds, fruit and the seeds, it forms the seed coat. So the outer integument forms the testa and the inner integument forms the tegment. The outer integument is obviously more protective in nature because it is thick and resistant and the inner one is a little thin and transparent. Then comes the micropyle which is an opening so the integuments don't fuse on this side on the opposite side of the calyxal end and hence it gives rise to formation of a narrow opening called as a micropyle. This is the region your pollen tube is going to enter the ovule. Now this anatropous ovule that we see here is bitegmic. Why? Because it shows two integuments, the outer and the inner. Hence it is known as bi, bi meaning two, tegmic meaning integuments. Now like we have seen the anatropous ovule here, there are different types of ovules which are present in angiosperms. Atropous ovule, if you see, it is unlike the anatropous ovule. So in it, the hilum, that is the notch where the furicle joins the ovule body, the micropyle and the chalicillin from where the integuments arise are in the straight line. And hence it is atropous. Then we have anatropus wherein it is slightly bent. So only the micropyle and the chalice are in the straight line. In amphitropus, the curvature is more pronounced. And in hemianatropus, it did not for give an 180 degree turn, but just about 90 degrees. So the calyx and the micropyle are still in a straight line. Then we have campylotropus wherein the micropyle and the calyx are not in a straight line and then we have the sarcinotropus wherein like it first made a turn like an anatropus ovule and then it turned back again the calyx and the micropyle are in the straight line but the hilum is not then let's come to the embryo sac the embryo sac is formed in a mature ovule in a mature ovule, we see the presence of seven cells and eight nuclei. There are three cells at the end towards the calyza, which is facing the calyza, and hence it is known as a calyzal end. Then we have three cells in the end facing the micropyle, and hence it is known as the micropylar end. And then we have the central region, which consists of one large cell with to haploid polar nuclei. The calyxal end consists of three cells which are known as the antipodal cells. Then we have the micropylar end which shows us three cells. This is known as the egg apparatus because the central cell is going to form our egg or the oosphere. This is the one going to get fertilized. The lateral cells are known as synergids and the large central cell is going to form the endosperm. This is known as the secondary nucleus. Now let us talk about the formation of a female gametophyte. The female gametophyte develops from an embryo sac mother cell. The embryo sac mother cell is derived from the hypodermis. One of the cells forms the archaesporangial cell which further forms the embryo sac mother cell. This is diploid and this undergoes meiosis and it gives rise to four haploid cells. Now all of these haploid cells are not required. So only the cell which is nearer or nearest to the nucellus or like towards the center of the nucellus is kept and all the other cells are aborted. Now this cell undergoes growth due to the nutrition obtained from the nucellus. Further, it undergoes mitosis 
in the first mitotic division it gives rise to two daughter nuclei later on another step happens where mitosis occurs this is your second mito mitotic division and gives rise to four nuclei further on another step wherein mitosis occurs so this is the third mitotic division here it gives rise to one two three four five six seven and eight nuclei now these eight nuclei or it says are divided so that they form the three antipodal cells the three egg apparatus cells and two polar nuclei so the upper three go on to form the antipodal cells the center two form the polar nuclei whereas the lower three form the egg apparatus cells now the antipodal cells are transported to the region which is nearest to the caliza the micropylar end receives the egg apparatus cells out of which the central egg cell forms the ova or the oospore whereas the two polar nuclei they fuse and form one cell with two nuclei so this is the mature embryo sac and these are the accessory cells the central cell this is the only cell which forms your oospore so this is your female gamete now we have generated the microspores and the megaspores the microspores were generated in the anther and the megaspores were generated in the pistil how do the microspores reach the megaspores for this there is a process known as pollination what exactly is pollination pollination is the process of transferring pollen grains from an anther to a stigma of a flower so the anther wherein the microspores or the male gametes were generated something or some process wherein these male gametes are picked up and put on to the receptive stigma of a flower through which it can form a pollen tube and fertilize the ovary so this process is required as pollen grains are non motile no where did we read that pollen grains consists of flagella or some other locomotory organ so that they can move and fertilize hence we need a process to transfer pollen grains this counts as the first step of fertilization because this is initiating it this is where the pollen grain is actually starting its journey towards the stigma it takes place almost in all angiosperms and seed bearing plants now let us understand how many types and what types of pollination are there so there is something known as autogamy and there is something known as cross pollination or allogamy auto meaning self so in this division we will see the fertilization occurring in the plant in the same plant itself and in cross pollination we will see fertilization occurring in two different plants autogamy uh, shows two types of fertilizations again that is homogamy and eutonogamy there is something known as a bisexual flower and a unisexual flower a bisexual flower will have both stamen as well as the carpel whereas a unisexual flower will have either a stamen or a carpel so it will only show one sexual world whereas a bisexual flower like a shoe flower will show both stamens as well as carpel in homogamy because it has both the stamen as well as the carpel the stamen of an x flower will have chances of pollinating the carpel of the same flower whereas in gitonogamy because it can have unisexual flowers also the possibility of fertilizing a flower of the same plant a different flower of the same plant arises so we have an x flower which has which can be bisexual or unisexual and it has stamen and there is a y flower which has carpel so and this is the same plant 
so this stamen can pass on its pollen grains to the carpel and hence within the same plant two different flowers are getting involved whereas in cross pollination there is xenogamy as well as hybridization in xenogamy you need different agents of pollination so someone who is willing to come pick up a pollen grain and pass it on to the stigma of a flower to of another plant so here we have the same plant here we have two different plants so uh, it can be a bisexual or a unisexual flower so this is an a plant and this is a b plant so if you have a stem in here the pollen grain will be passed on from the stem in of a plant to the carpel of b plant so you have two different plants so two different genetic materials uh, two completely different gene pools which are present whereas in homogamy and geitonogamy it is essentially the same plant but in homogamy it is the same flower and geitonogamy it is a different flower so there is less genetic variation in homogamy and geitonogamy so it is not really much preferred by plants however in xenogamy it is two different plants so there is much more chances of variation and evolution so this is more preferred by plants in nature in hybridization what happens is until now we knew that we assume that a and b plants belong to the same species but in hybridization it can occur that the pollen has fertilized a flower of another subspecies which contains slightly different genetic modifications or altogether different species which will give rise to a completely different type of a plant this is not very common in nature because the flowers or the plants are very specific to the pollen grains of its own species however when this happens it leads to hybridization and it almost always leads to leads to the choice of superior characters so if only if the plant contains really good characters is it allowed to live otherwise nature discards it and hence we don't have many naturally hybridized plants almost all of the hybridized plants that we notice are manual now let's talk about different agents of pollination or the factors which cause pollination wind is one of the abiotic agent or a non living agent the pollination through wind is known as anemophily the flowers which are pollinated by wind are small inconspicuous colorless they have no nectar and no fragrance let's come to each point individually flowers are small the flower need not be really huge with lots of colors and fragrance and nectar and really showy because the wind cannot see it all it needs is light enough pollen grains so that it can take it along with it so the flowers are not really huge and showy show off worthy the pollen grains are light because they have to fly with the wind dry and in large numbers when you have a lot of pollen grains what happens is when the wind is carrying pollen grains some of it might fall in barren land some of it might fall on different species of plants altogether so if you have a lot of pollen grains there are chances of at least 5 to 10 to 20% of it falling on the correct plant and thus fertilizing it this just increases the chances of fertilization the stigma is feathery to trap pollen so more the number of feathers more the surface area and more the ability to trap the pollen grains and the stamens are elongated and show versatile anthers so this is wheat cob and here if you can see this is the anther if you see it is attached by a very small connector which means the anthers can move freely in the wind so if if the wind blows in this direction this can really move freely and this will lead to 
dehisis and the release of pollen grains and it will fly with the wind and maybe deposit on a stigma of another plant's flowers or the same flowers. If you see the stigma are also really feathery and if you see the stigma is also really very feathery. So this will trap these pollen grains. Now we have another abiotic agent which is water. Now transfer of pollen through water is known as hydrophily, water loving. The flowers are mostly unisexual. They are small, inconspicuous with no fragrance and nectar. Similar characters because water cannot taste, see or really doesn't need to invest energy in forming more attractive flowers. The pollen grains of floral parts are unwettable. Now one of the biggest problem with water is the plant can rot due to repeated exposure with water. So what happens is it secretes mucilage. Mucilage covers each plant part or in this case specifically pollen grains so that it can protect it from water and prevent it from rotting. Stigma is long and sticky because when the pollen grain is moving through water it can just flow off. So the stigma is long so that it can reach far and wide and sticky so that it can immediately attach to the pollen grain. We have two types of hydrophily that is observed, commonly observed. One is hypohydrophily wherein just one second wherein you can see that the pollen grains which have been released from this plant Thalassia are just below the surface of water. So therefore it is hypohydrophily and they move towards the, they go on with the flow of water and they, so once these pollen grains which are large and have ribbon like structures, once they reach the female reproductive world that is the stigma region, they will just attached to the stigma and spiral around them with their ribbon like structures. So this ensures optimal attachment. Then we have epihydrophily wherein the pollen grains travel just on the surface of water for example in Valicinaria. So uh, in this it is a very interesting phenomenon to observe that the male inflorescence is really tiny so it's not really reaching to the surface of water but the pollen grains are light enough and they travel to the surface normally the female uh, part that is your carpels are usually really coiled and present below the surface of water but in their maturation stages that is us time jab Uska fertilization period, the mating period starts, that's when the coil opens and the carpel travels to the surface of water and this is where it will come in contact with the pollen grain and thus get fertilized. Now let's talk about some biotic factors which are living agents that will facilitate pollination. We have lots of living creatures which will help in picking up a pollen grain from a flower and taking it to another flower. Biotic factors are some of the most amazing agents which help in cross-pollination. Because the, for example, if you take a bee, it will go to a flower, take its nectar and go to another plant and many more plants and thus it has more chances of taking the pollen grain far and wide and hence it will help the pollen grain genetically different individual plants and then fertilize it and hence it can lead to variety uniqueness unique now 80 percent plants need help of other living creatures for pollination Animals like bats, snails, birds, lemurs which are primates are known to aid in pollination. They help pollination. This phenomenon where animals 
help transfer of pollen grains is called as zoophily. There are three common types of zoophily that we observe and we will be studying today. It is entomophily, ornithophily and chiropterophily. Let's start with entomophily. Entomophily is essentially pollination by insects. Entomo Entomology is the study of insects and pollination by uh, insects is known as entomophily. Here we are talking about bees because 80% of insects that pollinate plants are bees and hence they are very important for pollination and in regions where flowering plants are grown. The flowers are large, showy and bright because they need to attract these insects. They have a sweet fragrance and nectar producing glands. You need something to attract, to lure the insects. Agar tum usse return mein kuch nahi de rahe ho, it will not come to you. So this gives it good fragrance to attract it door se and then it gives, produces a lot of nectar so that it lets it be with it for some time. Then the stigma is sticky due to mucilage and rough as it is hairy. The pollen grains are spiny and surrounded by pollen kit. It is a yellow sticky substance. So the pollen grains are spiny because they can easily, if you can see these bristles, they will easily get attached here. And hence the bee can act as a carrier. So this is a salvia flower and this is a honeybee, as you can see. And in this you observe lever mechanism. So what happens in this? If you see this part, this is the stamen and this is fertile. This will be a part of it, maybe this and this is, it, will, it is just below this honeybee and that is the another stamen. So this stamen is essentially in this form and what you are seeing that is this part. This is the fertile one, so this is the anthers hai, and us anther pe dher sare pollen grains. Hai. To jaise hi ye a, let me just change the color. To jaise hi ye honey bee yahan se enter karta hai flower ke andar, jaise ab isne kiya, ye is pe press karta hai. Jab ye is pe press karta hai, because ye dono connected hai, ye niche ki or aata hai, aur ye anthers निकल कर इसके पीट पे लग जाते हैं। फिर अगले फ्लावर में जब ये जाएगा, इसके अंदर से अगर वो फीमेल फ्लावर हुआ, तो या उस गाइनेशियम पे इसका पोलिंग्रेन रब ऑफ हो जाएगा एंड इससे पोलिनेशन होगा। Then we have ornithophily, this is pollination by birds. हम बहुत सारे ऐसे बर्ड्स नहीं देखते जो पॉलिनेशन करते हैं सन बर्ड्स हमिंग बर्ड्स दीज आर सम ऑफ द मोस्ट कॉमनली ऑब्जर्व वंस क्योंकि हमें बहुत छोटे छोटे बर्ड्स चाहिए बिकॉज़ फ्लावर्स रिलेटिवली छोटे होते हैं एंड यू नीड बर्ड्स विद लॉन्ग बीक्स सो हियर यू कैन ऑब्जर्व हमिंग बीज व्हिच आर फीडिंग फ्रॉम बिग्नोनिया इसमें भी द फ्लावर्स नीड टू बी रियली लार्ज शोई एंड दे शुड सिक्रीट लॉट ऑफ नेक्टर सो दैट द बर्ड्स spend enough time with the flower so that they can collect the pollen grains. Usme fragrance ho ye zaruri nahi hai because birds cannot really smell and sticky and spiny pollen grains so that they can attach easily to the bird. Phir hum bats tak pochte hai. This is known as chiropterophily. Chiroptera are the bats and bats are nocturnal creatures. So ye un plants ko फर्टिलाइज पोलिनेट करने में हेल्प करेंगे जो रात को ओपन होते हैं विच आर नॉक्टर्नल सो वन ऑफ द क्लासिक एग्जांपल्स इज अ डांसोनिया इसके फ्लावर्स रात को ओपन होते हैं एंड इफ यू सी द फ्लावर इज रियली ह्यूज इतना बड़ा है कि ये बैट का वेट उठा पा रहा है एंड देन बहुत ब्यूटीफुल नहीं होंगे बट दे आर लाइट इन कलर कंपेरेटिवली बिकॉज रात को आराम से दिखना चाहिए बैट्स Communicate by echolocation, but they can also see slightly. And 
नेक्टर ढेर सारा प्रोड्यूस हो ताकि बैट उतने देर वहाँ टाइम स्पेंड करे कि पोलिन ग्रेन्स उसके बॉडी पे लग जाए पोलिन एडिबल भी होता है तो बैट ड्रॉपिंग से भी पोलिनेशन हो सकता है एंड फ्लावर्स गिव आउट इट रैदर अनप्लीजिंग वाटर लाइक दैट ऑफ अ रॉट एंड फ्रूट देन इफ वी हैव सो मैनी एजेंट्स ऑफ पोलिनेशन एंड एवरीथिंग वी स्टिल हैव होमोगैमी राइट ऑटोगैमी वेर इन द प्लांट इज पॉलीनेटिंग इट्स पर जैसे मैंने कहा प्लांट्स डोंट रियली प्रेफर होमोगैमी और ऑटोगैमी उनको वेरिएशन चाहिए सो दैट दे कैन इंक्रीज दियर जेनेटिक डाइवर्सिटी तो प्लांट्स ने क्या किया दे हैव डेवलप सर्टन डिवाइज नोन एज आउट ब्रीडिंग डिवाइज जिससे वो खुद के पॉलिन से फर्टिलाइज होने से रोक सके सो so, बिकॉज मोस्ट एंड जो स्पॉन्स प्रोड्यूस बाई सेक्शुअल फ्लावर्स उसमें मेल वर्ल्ड भी होगा फीमेल वर्ल्ड भी होगा तो हम चांसेस कैसे कम करें कि वो प्लांट खुद के पोलिन से फर्टिलाइज ना हो सो क्रॉस पॉलिनेशन इज ऑलवेज प्रेफर प्लांट्स हैव डेवलप सर्टन मेकेनिजम्स टू प्रिवेंट और रिड्यूज चांसेस ऑफ सेव पॉलिनेशन दिस मेकेनिजम्स आर कॉल्ड आउट ब्रीडिंग डिवाइस अब वन ऑफ द वेज दे डू इट इज यूनिसेक्शुअलिटी मेल एंड फीमेल फ्लावर्स आर बोर्न सेपरेटली तो उन्होंने क्या किया वो प्लांट बाई सेक्शुअल है पर इंडिविजुअल फ्लावर यूनिसेक्शुअल है तो मतलब एक ही ब्रांच पे यहाँ मेल फ्लावर हो सकता है यहाँ फीमेल फ्लावर हो सकता है तो इससे काफ़ी हद तक चांसेस कम हो जाते हैं मेल फ्लावर फीमेल फ्लावर को पॉलिनेट करें सो so, इसमें भी दो कंडीशन अराइज होते हैं अगर मेल और फीमेल फ्लावर एक ही प्लांट पे हो उसको मोनोइशियस बोलेंगे एंड इफ मेल एंड फीमेल फ्लावर्स आर ऑन डिफरेंट प्लांट्स तो मतलब ये पूरा प्लांट ही मेल प्लांट हो जाएगा और ये पूरा प्लांट ही फीमेल प्लांट हो जाएगा दिस इज नोन एज डाइशियस कंडीशन मोनोइशियस कंडीशन आप देखते हैं मेज में विच इज़ योर कॉन एंड देन डाइशियस कंडीशन आपको पपाया में दिख जाता है देन यू हैव टाइकोगी इन अ बाई सेक्शुअल फ्लावर एंथर्स एंड स्टिगमा मेच्योर डिफरेंट टाइप्स तो अब हर प्लांट तो यूनिसेक्शुअल फ्लावर्स प्रोड्यूस नहीं करने वाला तो उन्होंने क्या किया हम एक ही बाई सेक्शुअल फ्लावर में अगर मेल है और फीमेल है हम इनकी मेच्योरिटी टाइम अलग कर देंगे सो इफ मेल मेच्योर है एक्स टाइम द फीमेल वर्ल्ड इन दैट प्लांट इट सेल्फ उस ही प्लांट में इट विल मेच्योर एट वाई टाइम इसका मतलब यह है कि जब मेल मेच्योर हुआ फीमेल मेच्योर नहीं है तो इवन इफ ये पॉलन ग्रेन फीमेल पर गिरता है वो उसको फर्टिलाइज नहीं कर सकता वो पॉलिनेट नहीं हो सकता तो इससे सेल्फ पॉलिनेशन के चांसेस वापस कम हो जाते हैं और दूसरे प्लांट की फीमेल can be मेच्योर and this can pollinate another plant's female. इसमें भी दो conditions है या तो male पहले mature हो या, या तो female पहले mature हो Male जब पहले mature होता है it is known as protandry. So androecium, which is the male वर्ल matures before gynecium. ये आपको sunflower में दिख जाता है And then protogyny, जहाँ पे female male वर्ल्ड मेल वर्ल्ड से पहले मेच्योर होता है ये आपको ग्लोरियोसा में दिख जाता है फिर वी हैव प्री पोटेंसी वेर इन पोलिन फ्रॉम अदर फ्लावर्स जॉमिनेट फास्टर दैन फ्रॉम द सेम फ्लावर प्री पोटेंसी में क्या होता है जब मेरा खुद का पोलिन मेरे स्टिग्मा पे गिरा और दूसरे प्लांट का भी पोलिन मेरे स्टिग्मा पे गिरा मैं मेरा स्टाइल और ओवरी इस तरह से डेवलप्ड है कि दूसरे प्लांट का पोलन जर्मिनेट होने के चांसेस ज़्यादा होंगे और ये होता है आपके एप्पल में देन वी हैव हेटेरो स्टाइली वेर हेटेरोमोर्फिक फ्लावर्स आर प्रोड्यूस्ड पोलिंग रेन्स प्रोड्यूस्ड एट द सेम लेवल पोलिन एट स्टिगमा एट द सेम लेवल एंड दिस हैपन सेम प्रोज इसे कैसे देखेंगे आप वे ये एस मॉर्फोलॉजी है इसे एस बोल दीजिए इसे एल कह दीजिए 
तो एस में क्या हुआ हम, मेरे जो आंथर्स हैं वो डेवलप हो रहे हैं स्टिग्मा के भी ऊपर लेवल पे एंड जो एल मॉर्फ है उसमें जो मेरे एंथर्स हैं वो नीचे की ओर डेवलप हो रहे हैं वेर एज मेरा स्टिग्मा इस अबव द एंथर्स अब इस केस में क्या हो जाता है अगर मेरे एंथर्स है हाई लेवल पे दिस कैन नॉट रियली गो एंड फर्टिलाइज हियर बट मेरे एंथर्स एक प्लांट में इस तरह से है एक फ्लावर में और दूसरे फ्लावर में स्टिकमा ऊपर की ओर है ये आराम से जाके उसको फर्टिलाइज कर सकता है इसीलिए दिस इज नोन एज हेटेरोस्टाइली डिफरेंट टाइप्स ऑफ स्टाइल्स आर प्रोड्यूस्ड सो स्टिकमा दिस इज द स्टिकमा एंड दिस स्टाइल इज ऑफ डिफरेंट हाइट्स फिर आता है आपका हर्कोगी जिसमें फिजिकल बैरियर होता है पॉलिनेशन प्रिवेंट करने के लिए या आपके कैलोट्रोपिस में होता है तो इसमें क्या होता है जो गाइनेशियम है या कार्पल है उसके ऊपर एक फिजिकल स्ट्रक्चर होता है तो इवन इफ मेरा पोलन ग्रेन इसके ऊपर गिरता है वो जर्मिनेट नहीं हो पाता बिकॉज द स्टिकमा इज़ नॉट एक्सपोज जब कोई इंसेक्ट आके बैठता है तो उसके पैरों से ये बैरियर ब्रेक हो जाता है और फिर जो पोलन ग्रेन वो लेकर आया है उससे ये फर्टिलाइज हो सकता है सो इट गेट इट गेट्स फर्टिलाइज बाय पोलन ग्रेन ऑफ अ डिफरेंट प्लांट ड्यू टू एन इंसेक्ट फिर सेल्फ इनकम्पैटेबिलिटी इसमें पोलन ग्रेन जो सेम फ्लावर का है उसको ग्रो होने ही नहीं देता है so the stigma doesn't let the pollen grain of the same flower to grow and this happens in tobacco so right now in this video we have learned about the development of a female gametophyte and different agents of pollination pollination kya hota hai aur self pollination rokne ke liye plants kya kya karte hain